Vice President uh, for Research and the Director of the Faculty Research Development Office and a co-PI on the advanced grant. So we're really glad to see everybody this afternoon for a um, research success series workshop. And um, the way we're gonna work today is each of our presenters will um, give a brief introduction of themselves and their um, program. And then we'll be opening it up for questions. Anytime throughout, if you um, want to pose a question in the chat, please feel free. We have Irene Gray from um, the Interdisciplinary Science Center who's helping us moderate, let people in, and we'll keep an eye on the chat. And then um, we also have Julia Fuldrum who is here. She is the Director of Advance. And um, doesn't want me to forget to remind you, and I'll probably remember to do it at the end too, that Advance has now posted their um, workshops for the fall on the Advance website, advance.unm.edu, and we encourage everybody to check that out and see some of the um, opportunities that are available for you um, related to success at UNM, how to be successful. So, um, I do also want to mention we are recording this session, so if you object to that, um, you can either just keep yourself silent or say goodbye, but we are um, planning to post this on the advanced website afterwards. If you got the advanced newsletter, um, you saw that we have posted some of the sessions that were held this summer, and those are available for you to view. Um, and so. We encourage you to check out the advanced website to see some of the different resources that are available to you. So with that, um, I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. We have um, Melinda Morgan, who is the Director of Sustainability Studies and the W.K. Kellogg Chair in Sustainable Environmental and Food Systems and an Associate Professor of Geography. Um, her research and scholarship focus on the emerging environmental governance regimes with a particular focus on how these approaches to environmental challenges interfere with existing legal and regulatory requirements. We have Francis Hayashida, Director of the Latin American and Iberian Institute and also a Professor of Anthropology. Um, she's an archaeologist and has worked primarily in Peru and Chile as well as Zacatecas, Mexico, Zuni, New Mexico, Northern California, and Southern Hungary. So a lot of international experience. And the main focus of her research is the political ecology of late prehistoric societies in the Andes and what happened to local people, their water and landscapes when they were forcibly incorporated into the Inca empire. And our third panelist is Christopher Lippitt, who's the faculty coordinator for the Interdisciplinary Science Cooperative and a Associate Professor of Geography. He's responsible for ensuring that the mission for the co-op is met. He's the founding faculty coordinator. And um, he also directs the Aspire Center, which is a center for advancement of spatial informatics research and education. So we have, are really pleased to have these three panelists with us today. And we're gonna invite each of them to talk just a little bit about the programs in which there are opportunities for you to participate in interdisciplinary uh, research and scholarship and education. And I'm gonna start with Melinda. And so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Melinda. Thank you so much, Mary Jo. And I'm gonna keep my comments brief because I think the discussion portion is always best in these forums. Um, I am delighted to be the new director for sustainability studies. And I'm, I'm also uh, um, really glad to see so many colleagues here. There are people on this Zoom that could easily be on the panel today, uh, including Bill Mitchner and Caroline Scruggs and others. Um, so glad to have a lot of good participants here, Jamie. Um, hoping to hear from a lot of voices today. Sustainability studies uh, is currently um, an interdisciplinary program on campus that has been around for a little over a dozen years. It is a small, I would say, but scrappy program. So right now um, we offer a, an, a interdisciplinary undergraduate minor um, for students who are interested in um, 
uh, in advancing um, very place-based and community-engaged work um, in sustainability. And so uh, there's a real emphasis in the program on taking what is their, um, their, their undergraduate major and leveraging their interest in their major uh, with an emphasis in sustainability. So we've got a capstone class uh, and a synergy class that helps them sort of put a sustainability lens um, through which they can look at their passion. And that is uh, where, we're, where we currently are. Um, as the new director, I'm interested in um, having us um, broaden our focus a little bit. And I'm really delighted to be a part of this panel because one of the ways I would like for us to, to broaden our focus is by increasing um, the number of affiliated faculty. So we do have affiliated faculty. Um, in sustainability studies, Monica, uh, Monica Kowal, who's on, on, the, on the Zoom here, just joined us. Um, Caroline is on, uh, Scruggs is on, on our affiliated faculty, but we want to broaden that. So if you have sustainability related research or teaching and would like to join our affiliated faculty, please contact me. Uh, at this point, it, that's all it means is that you're interested uh, in, in having a sustainability oriented research and teaching. Um, but I'm interested in having uh, that faculty potentially mean more, that maybe we're an organized um, cohort on campus that is advancing sustainability-related research and teaching. Uh, and in, in addition to that, I'm also interested in having the sustainability studies program start to have more of an emphasis on supporting faculty who are interested in doing uh, interdisciplinary related research and teaching. So um, one example of that is that we're starting to stand up some interdisciplinary collaboratives. Um, the first of which is a collaborative uh, focusing on the Rio Grande watershed. Um, and um, Mary Jo and Chris um, Lippitt and, the, um, and Irene Gray and the uh, interdisciplinary co-op uh, are our sort of co-conspirators in that, the co-sponsors. Uh, we've got a lot of different co-sponsors involved in that effort. Um, and we are um, currently engaged in a webinar series as we learn about that watershed and what it means to do interdisciplinary research related to water supply in that watershed. Um, and in hopes of creating a um, sort of an ongoing a social ecological systems based uh, research unit on campus that is uh, serving the needs of uh, community leaders in the watershed. So um, if you're interested in joining that webinar, we just have had one, one meeting so far. We've got another one uh, next week. Um, and so we can provide you, in fact, maybe all Irene or I can throw into the chat a little link for registration to that. Um, but there's another one. Uh, uh, that is just uh, that Irene is taking the lead on helping people organize um, uh, related to, and I see more people are joining us, so I'm, I need to refresh who's on the call at this point. But there's another group uh, of scholars um, that are affiliated faculty that are interested in a climate change and health collaborative. So sustainability studies has been student oriented and we want to remain very student focused and, and, and oriented, but we also want to start increasing our engagement with faculty um, and supporting interdisciplinary sustainability related research. Um, and I'll just stop there and let, let the other panelists go and then be available for questions. Thank you, Melinda. And um, Irene has put the um, link for the webinar series in the chat if anybody's interested. We're going to move forward um, to Francis Hayashida. And Francis, I did make it so you can share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I am the director of the Latin American and Iberian Institute. Uh, and the Institute uh, is responsible for uh, promoting research, teaching, and outreach related to Latin America uh, and Iberia here at UNM. And so it's, it's, covers, you know, people working across the entire university, um, you know, North Campus as well as, as main campus, uh, all colleges and schools, um, including the, you know, the different prof professional schools. Um, we have uh, affiliated faculty who work in or have interests in Latin America, 
um, and Iberia, and it's the list now is about 150 people. So UNM is a is a really uh, has a very strong program um, in primarily Latin American, but also Iberian studies. Um, Latin American studies is 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 part of of LAII, uh, although it's it's actually housed under the College of Arts and Sciences, and there are um, undergraduate and graduate degrees, um, which are theme based uh, and and therefore you know, um, intrinsically uh, interdisciplinary. Um, the, the, what, the, one of the, the things that LAI has been doing in the past and that will be continuing um, is this, you know, encouraging people not, you know, not just being an umbrella where there are all these people from different disciplines working, um, but being a place where people can connect with each other uh, to be able to form interdisciplinary um, uh, collaborations. Um, some of the ways that we do this is, is, is sort of um, more informal. So we have a number of different uh, committees that um, uh, are related to governance of LAII, but are also related to making decisions about our different funding programs. So we have funding, for example, for graduate students, field research grants, uh, as well as PhD fellowships. These are two-year PhD fellowships. And the committee that makes uh, the decisions on, you know, the students to receive this funding um, is our grants and awards committee. Draws people from all over the university, um, and it's an opportunity uh, through this through this service that's supporting students to get to know faculty from different parts of, of the university. Um, there are also more formal ways that LAI has been been trying to encourage interdisciplinary work. Um, uh, here at UNM, and I'm going to talk about two different funding programs that we have. Uh, and I'm this is the part I think where I'm going to uh, ask to have the screen. Let's see, can people see this? Not yet. Not did yet. You hit, did you hit share? Oops, maybe I didn't. Hang on. That's looking good. That's looking good. Okay, great. Now, can you still can you still see it? We actually see the other screens. If you go back to the way it was before, it's better. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Never mind. Sorry, I'm still forgetting the zoom. There you go. Out, That'll work. Okay. You know, I'm just going to show you the PDF. It's easier. Okay. <laughs> So the two, the two different, you know, we have these two different uh, funding programs for interdisciplinary faculty funding. Um, and uh, what they have in common, what the two programs have in common is that the, the thing that's being proposed should somehow be related to human societies, culture, um, or language. Um, so, so they can include physical, biological, health sciences, but there should be this, this you know, this, this human um, um, part of it. Um, also, the other thing that we're looking for is the potential of what's being proposed to, dis to deepen interdisciplinary collaboration at UNM and beyond. So um, it's not like you as an individual will come in and say, hey, I want to be interdisciplinary, um, but rather that it, you, know, you, you begin to form those interdisciplinary collaborations and then together you're submitting uh, proposals. Uh, we also want to see projects that reach a diverse campus and community audience. Um, so you, you want to be thinking about um, topics that are not hyper specialized, right? So these are things that you want, that will have uh, more general um, interest and appeal. Uh, finally, we're looking for projects that have the potential to seed future external funding uh, where that's appropriate. The two different grant programs we have, the first one is the Interdisciplinary Project Development Grant. Uh, and this is seed funding for research or creative activities. It's up to $5,000 uh, and can be used, for example, for things like workshops um, or you and, and a collaborator uh, can travel to your research site to do some pilot work. Um, you might bring, bring in to UNM uh, non-UNM collaborators or advisors. Uh, you could use it to support research assistance. The second uh, funding program is uh, money that's provided for the Greenleaf Interdisciplinary Symposium on Latin America. Um, 
And the expectation is that there'll be UNM and non-UNM speakers. It's up to $10,000. And um, the kinds of expenses that you could, could cover would, would be things like participant travel uh, and different kinds of conference expenses. Um, we're, I'm, we're tweaking a little bit the, both the calls for both programs, uh, but the deadlines will be sometime in March. And I would be happy you know, to answer any, any questions that people have if you want to just take down my, my email address. Um, these aren't, we don't have student funding programs. I know there, I saw some students that had signed up for this. We don't have student funding programs uh, for interdisciplinary, you know, specifically for interdisciplinary uh, funding. We do have other student funding programs. I'd be happy to talk to students as well about um, you know, either their thoughts on trying to develop something interdisciplinary or about our, our student funding programs. So those are the main things that I just uh, that I wanted to cover today. Thank you, Francis. And if you wouldn't mind, stop sharing. I will do that. And we will go on to Chris Lippett. Thanks. I think we're going to try to throw a slide up there as well if we can. Okay. Let's see. All right. Oh, almost. We're, we've All got right. That. Well, so I can. We'll we'll work that out as we, okay. as, we as we go here. Um, so um, my name's Chris Lippitt. Um, I'm, uh, as Mary Jo mentioned, uh, I'm here in my role as the faculty coordinator for the Interdisciplinary Science Cooperative. Um, many of you may not have heard that heard of that unit before because it didn't exist until very recently. So um, <clears throat> the IS Co-op, as we often refer to it, or the Co-op, is a uh, organization under arts and sciences. Um, and uh, it is an administrative unit, um, but uh, we uh, have, a, have a broader uh, mission than, than serving our centers. Uh, but we have seven resident centers within the Co-op. Um, and we've, you'll recognize those uh, from around the campus that we've brought together um, to form the co-op. Um, and so if we, Irene, if you want to jump to the next slide. So really where this came out of, if you may, some of you may remember the D2K conferences um, that the College of Arts and Sciences put on um, and that's data to knowledge, right? And so the, the, the kind of central theme of those conferences was we're generating very large amounts of of data and there are shared uh, skills and and methods required to, to interrogate those data and to try to get useful information out of them. And so we found that, that was a useful organizing theme that brought together a lot of different groups uh, from around arts and sciences um, and um, had some, some thoughts in mind when we were thinking about converting what was the D2K concept into the co-op. And that is one, increased federal funding for uh, research of this type <clears throat> um, and and you know our own personal recognition and, and belief that that this is uh, an important area to be to be moving into uh, as an institution, um, and um, we wanted to move from you know what was a, a conference and a, and a working community of people to something that could be a sustained activity where we could um, uh, begin to um, support this type of work happening around campus in a, in a more material way. Um, and so that's where the idea for the co-op came from, and uh, we officially formed, I suppose, in uh, late 2019, um, and uh, have still been moving into our uh, fabulous empty building. Um, so uh, if you want to jump to the next slide. Uh, so this is the, uh, the co-op team. and. Um, I, I was I was cruel to Irene this morning, and she put these slides together, so that's why my picture looks like that. Um, but the this is uh, the the various groups within the co-op. Um, so each one of the colored corners that you're seeing on the right are is a center, a category two center within the College of Arts and Sciences. Some of them have been around for quite a while, and you've you've heard of before. Um, CHIMP, uh, you may have heard of, is, is uh, largely based out of anthropology, uh, but has a lot of interdisciplinary collaborators. Uh, the Center for Quantum Information Control is largely based out of physics, uh, but has a lot of inter interdisciplinary collaborators. Um, 
And uh, CSI, the Center for Stable Isotopes, uh, uh, is another one that has been around and been very successful for quite some time. Some of these are new um, organizations of people. Um, and so uh, the Center for the Advancement of Spatial Informatics Research and Education um, is, is a new center that started in 2020. Uh, Center for Computational Genomics and Technology is a new center starting in 2020. Um, and um, I, I should, I, I spoke slightly, um, a couple of our units are not technically Category 2 centers. Um, they are, are labs. Um, and so uh, we have groups represented from most of arts and sciences in these centers and a lot of the other units on campus, in particular engineering, uh, is, is well represented within these groups. We do have a, a, a team um, that is, uh, you know, here to support those centers uh, in, in all of the great interdisciplinary work that they do, and they're the ones that really have, um, you know, where the rubber meets the road. They hold their own brown bag events on a weekly basis. They have their own speakers. They have their own programming going on, and we're here to, to help support all that in addition to developing our own programming um, that is meant to facilitate uh, more interdisciplinary work on campus. We really have a fairly broad mandate in that. But what you can see is we have a fairly small staff, and so um, Carla uh, helps us um, administer uh, all of the um, uh, the program, the accounting, the, the the facilities, all of that. And Irene, who you're meeting here on the line today, um, is is really charged with developing um, events and sets of programming and uh, that support our mission. And so I'll mention a couple of those things uh, coming up. And then um, Haifei Chen uh, just joined us, um, but he's a, he's a, a research scientist, a, a PhD research scientist, who um, is actually here to help support develop proposals um, and help, help teams work through uh, issues and, and help us develop some of our integrating technology that I'll mention in just a second. So we can jump to the next slide. So we do have some spaces, and um, because uh, irony knows no bounds, um, we uh, opened right before COVID hit. Um, and so uh, all of our spaces are designed for collaboration, and uh, collaboration is now banned um, as, a, as a physical activity. So, um, but I really welcome, look forward to welcoming you, you all back. Um, and so we have some fantastic spaces that are really designed to make collaboration happen. And so the kind of culmination of that is uh, what we call the co-op room. Um, it's, a, it's a large space with all movable furniture that can account, um, accommodate multiple teams working uh, in groups and is meant to give us surge flexibility space for projects that um, don't have a home, that need to draw people from lots of different places together. Um, we also have a, a large visualization facility in Pais um, that uh, is uh, both a training for coding and visualization facility and uh, a, you know, something you can access. Uh, anyone on campus can, can use that facility. Um, and, and meeting spaces throughout the building. And so we'll ha have, a, have, you can access these spaces, you can reserve these spaces for yourself. Um, and then um, we use these spaces for all sorts of events that, that we will be inviting all of you to um, over the coming months. So we could jump to the next slide. So just um, uh, in, to give you a, a taste of what the, our, our activities look like on the ground right now, um, you heard about the Rio Grande Research Collaborative. Um, and this is, um, that's a great example of exactly the type of ongoing collaborative research teams that we want to help facilitate. Um, we uh, believe that if, you're, that if we can have research teams that are um, working together and, and understanding um, each other's terminology and problem sets uh, on an ongoing basis, that when these uh, proposal opportunities present themselves, we're going to be much better positioned to, to, to go after them, um, and that we can um, uh, be doing better science than we otherwise would be because we'll already have uh, uh, the right people in the room. Um, and so we're, we are planning on supporting more of those activities, a couple of those uh, at a time, at any given time. Um, and uh, there's another one in development right now that I won't quite mention yet because it's not ready for prime time. But um, we also are recently were awarded a museum research traineeship in NRT from NSF uh, that Tom Turner's leading that's based out of the co-op. Um, 
and and part of the reason that those are exactly the kind of awards that we want to support going after um, we're, we're working on other kind of large integrative uh, proposals stcs um, large proposal large integrated proposals are what we want to facilitate um, and um, we have uh, an undergraduate fellowship in water management that we've been able to develop with donor money um, and we're developing programming and technology to make it so that you can come and meet people um, and that when you do meet people that we can help support uh, those uh, testing out whether those uh, connections and opportunities are worth pursuing and help you pursue them if they are. Um, so I'd like to invite you all to our virtual grand opening. Um, you, uh, I don't encourage you to go explore the building at the moment, uh, but I would love to have you there in person soon. But we will have a virtual grand opening where you can see we have uh, fantastic videos of, of the building and that will explain kind of our mission and more about each individual center. And uh, you'll hear from uh, President Stokes and, and from Dean Peasney on their perspective on the, on the co-op and what we're doing. And then um, last but not least, yeah, um, reach out to us anytime. Um, we do have a website. Uh, you can check out more information about what we're doing, about what the centers are doing, our events. You can um, reserve spaces uh, for very far in the future. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about any of this, please, you can always reach out to me or Irene is a good first contact uh, if it's uh, looking for any of our support. Thank you, Chris. Um, with that, I'm going to pause. And if anybody has any questions for any of our panelists at this point, you can either type it into the um, chat or you can raise your little blue hand. And that is under if you um, expand the participant list by clicking on that you'll get a, a thing that allows you to raise a blue hand. Um, and, you know, each of these programs is a great resource for faculty, both for your research and for your educational programs. And um, they represent a focus that UNM has on trying to grow interdisciplinary research. Um, I don't have a question yet, so I'm going to ask the panelists. So we have all of this. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, Mindy. Back to you. <laughs> She's given us love. Um, it's supposed to be just to Caroline who has to jump off, but uh, yeah, I'll have a kiss for everybody. <laughs> so Bill Mitchner is asking, Chris, do you do you support development of engineering research centers as well, ERCs? Um, we have, as, as I understand it, uh, we have the, I, I have the flexibility to do that. So the way I look at it is that we are interested in, we, we don't see ourselves as being limited to the College of Arts and Sciences in any way, shape or form. Um, our, all of our centers are based within the College of Arts and Sciences, um, but our, our mission to foster interdisciplinary work uh, does not stop there. And we would just need to work out the, the f and return issues with EDL. Um, thank you, Chris. So um, let me ask each of the panelists then. So, you know, why should faculty want to go in this direction? What are the advantages of going outside of their own specific discipline and looking at um, ways they could connect with other disciplines? And um, I will just randomly say, well, Mindy was smiling, so I'm going to go with Mindy. Um, yeah, I, I think this is such a great question. I mean, I think that for me, uh, depending on your field, um, you know, uh, you know, certainly in my field, which is the field of you know uh, natural resources and environmental questions, the interesting questions are interdisciplinary questions. Um, you know, we cannot answer. Um, the what we call often the wicked problems of climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, rates of resource consumption. We can't take on the, the challenges of the Anthropocene uh, without uh, reaching out across um, disciplines. And, and so um, we need to get better at doing that work. And that's why I'm so passionate about doing it. 
Um, I think for most people, the question is not, is not when, but how, it is not whether to do it, but when and how to do it. Um, so how to do it most productively and how to do it and what, at what point in your career and also to how to make sure you're doing it in a way that's really fun and engaging and, 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 and um, really enhancing what you're doing. So I've always done a mix personally. So I, you know, at, the, at the end of the day, I actually have a JD, so I'm a legal scholar and I've always done a mix of sort of, you know, really pure sort of legal scholarship in addition to doing um, um, interdisciplinary scholarship. Um, and we can talk about the, the 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 reasons why I do that, but I think that that's that's why for me I'm so passionate about the why, which is if we're going to be um, uh, scholars who really respond to the needs of society, I think we need to take on interdisciplinary questions, and I'll let others answer as well. Francis, would you like to address that? No, I would I would just. Um, uh, agree with with what Mindy said. I mean, the you know the big the big questions are questions that require expertise from from a lot of um, different fields, um, and and the and, and so I think that there's that's the main reason. I think the other reason too, just sort of more personally, is I I think um, for myself that I I found that that just sort of in my own work and then just seeing other people's work that that you that you answer, you do your best work, I think, when you're challenged to go a little bit outside of, or, or a lot outside of your comfort zone, and being required to sort of hear other perspectives, see where other people are coming from, um, and, and then think about problems in a way that you haven't thought about them before. Uh, and you don't do that just sitting in your office at your desk. Thank you. So, Chris, your turn. In addition to what we've just heard, um, you know, IESA or the Interdisciplinary Science Center has some physical challenges to co to collaboration right now in the time of COVID. But what are some of the other challenges that you see that will need to be overcome in order to um, move interdisciplinary work forward at UNM? Sure. So, um, uh, I mean. To, to address the, the first question, I mean, clearly there's value in uh, problems that can't be solved within, a, within an individual discipline. And that value, depending on your perspective, is, is substantially greater or, or less so than, than working narrowly within a, in a specific discipline. I see specific disciplines as scaffolding. And so um, they are pushing the bounds of knowledge in a particular direction. And it's slow to build steel pipes that are gonna hold up scaffolding, right? It's a, to push the boundaries of a narrow topic of knowledge far takes time and, and takes dedicated effort. And so there's a lot of value in disciplinary effort, but there's a lot of area and volume to be occupied in between there where we can produce massive amounts of value in very short amounts of time with respect to societal benefit. And so um, that's why I'm excited about the work, just like, um, uh, Mel and Francis have, have indicated. I do think, though, that there's real reason, as a particularly within the academy and its hierarchical structure and its incentive structures, to be a little bit wary about over-investing in large team science as a young scholar, um, the way the incentives are structured right now. Um, I think that that's incumbent upon all of us to um, decide if that's how we actually want it to be. I personally don't think that's what makes sense. And, and to start removing those barriers and make it so that the extra investment that it takes to learn how to work with a new team or to learn how to work with people that don't speak the exact same language you do, um, worth it. Because in the beginning, the research says your publication rates, your productivity rates are going to be lower. And that does get made up for over time. But um, that doesn't matter to someone who has to put in a tenure packet in 24 months. Right? So, um, so there's, there's, there's definitely reasons to be intentional about how much you invest in this type of work when in your career um, as a scientist. But I think from a student perspective, from a training perspective, that if we are training people who do this type of work natively, 
we're buying down the cost for them to doing this work in the future. Just like a, a five-year-old can learn Spanish a heck of a lot faster than I can, um, a, a, a student who is, who is actively engaged in acquiring knowledge on a day-to-day -day basis and trying to, to under, frame their understanding of a problem set already working in this way means that they're going to be able to do it much more efficiently than I can. You know, that is, that is such a, a good point um, that Chris just made, and I'd be interested to hear what um, some of our more senior colleagues like Julia Polja and Bill Stanley and Bill Minster might have to say about, about wisdom um, on, on that for, for in investment earlier in the career. You know, I, but I do think one thing I wanted to point out is that th this, that we've been talking, you know, about, about the, you know, the, um, this training component, I think, is really worth emphasizing because one of the things that we get to do when we do the, the research ourselves is we get to involve our students in that work. And I, I, de I also, I know very much that in the marketplace, um, people are looking for people who can work in teams. And, and that one of the things that we're interested in doing in the Sustainability Studies program is developing some certificate programs um, and one of the things that, one of those certificates that I'd like to develop over time, I don't think it's gonna be the first one out of the gate, but is, is a sort of a sustainability science certificate in which we really intentionally develop um, programs where working in teams and working in place in, in, in communities and those types of skill sets are really emphasized because tools and approaches are a big part of what, um, employers are looking for um, in, our, in our graduates at the graduate level, um, their capacity to do that work. Thank you. Um, so Mindy just called out Bill and Bill, Michener and um, Stanley. And I don't know if either of you would like to weigh in on this, this perspective. I'll pause for just a minute. Uh, sure, I can jump in quickly. My camera's not working for some reason. I've had uh, some issues with it, so I can't be visible. But um, I think there are some really good e exemplars out there in terms of building a culture of team science and particularly interdisciplinary team science. And I would especially encourage folks to look at Arizona State in terms of what they've done. And it's been from the top down, uh, the president all the way down through the ranks is really focused on that. And they've created many, many interdisciplinary centers there. And it's built into the entire culture of the institution. I think we're a long way from that at UNM, but some ways to get there are uh, exposure of people to the Science of Team Science Conference. For example, I see Carmen uh, is on the, um, webinar here and she and I both, I think possibly some others have attended those particular meetings, but they have um, a series of webinars that they offer in terms of how to build interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary teams, uh, a whole variety of different tools that can be used. And we try and do some of this in EPSCoR. We offer early career faculty training as well as uh, team science leadership training as well and the next one will be offered a year from january but we held one this um, past january that was uh, incredibly successful but there are some resources out there that again the science of team science conference and the webinars and special interest groups that they support would be uh, really valuable resources for people to tap into Thank you, Bill. Yeah, I've attended some of those Science of Team Science conferences as well, and I agree, there, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, Julia had we're, asked, a, oh, go ahead, Chris. I was, I, I was just gonna say, we're just, uh, we'll, we can't announce anything at the moment, but we are working to bring um, that type of programming to campus, and so, um, look out for our mailings on events uh, where we're, we're looking to bring those workshops and trainings here. Um, and we'll work with Bill and, and you, Mary Jo, and the others that have done that in the past to, to, to do that. But you should hear from us soon on some of those opportunities. Thanks. 
Um, so Julia asked a question if, if you had any specific advice for assistant professors who might want to become involved in interdisciplinary efforts that are safe and supportive to their career plans as well. <laughs> um, Mindy or oh. Francis, yeah. go for it. Yeah, please go, Francis. No, I was just going to say that that not all interdisciplinary collaborations are these, you know, big team science, gigantic grant um, initiatives. I think that's more true, Chris, in the kind in the in the hard science um, fields that, that you work in. Um, but you know, but but there are you know possibilities for for doing things at a at a uh, not such, such a gigantic scale that can still be be very beneficial. Um, Ashley was going to call, call because she's here and I, I Jamie Nunez, <laughs> to have, have her speak as somebody who got one of our um, interdisciplinary grants and then they actually turned that into uh, a, a workshop and, and uh, some publications. Jamie, I don't know if you want to, if you feel okay talking about that a little bit. Thanks. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wasn't expecting to show up to a meeting in my baseball hat here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I have found personally that that tapping into other um, sort of clusters of people that are interested in topics that I'm interested in via um, LAI, but also there's a really interesting water cluster that's developed, sounds like in like a number of places, it's now sort of con congealing um, so the way that I've done that is to apply for smaller grants and these have cultivated small, you know, just small publication opportunities, articles, an edited special issue. But um, I have felt that that's supportive of my career, not only in terms of publications, but also to feeling rooted um, and to sort of pursuing some longer term strategies to build larger collaborative research projects. So I feel like there are short term and long term payoffs. There. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, Francis, but um, we applied for the LAI Greenleaf, um, and that led to a special issue symposium, a special issue symposium, and then um, the other sort of smaller interdisciplinary grant that you mentioned as well. And so, it's been it's been really great for me to feel like there's more community for me outside of my department as well. I would add a couple of things. I mean, I, I like to joke, um, you date before you marry. So it's always good if you're looking to explore an interdisciplinary engagement that you do something small with someone first. So before you agree to jump into my, what might be a five year um, uh, commitment, maybe you do a conference paper with someone and you see if they will actually meet their deadlines, if they meet their commitments, if they, um, you know, you get to know your working relationship with someone um, and that you can learn a lot about someone just doing something small and, and, and uh, I've, I've learned a lot from that process um, because the, these interdisciplinary projects tend to take a lot of time and so you want to make sure that you're, that when you are then moving to these larger projects that you're actually investing time with people that you want to be spending a lot of time with. And then the other piece of advice I tend to give is, is it's kind of good to have things on different types of timelines. So you, especially as an early scholar, you don't want to be putting a lot of things in the pipeline that are going to take three years to come to fruition. And then if in a situation where for your mid probationary review, you don't have things that have actually um, come to fruition yet. Um, so you want to be uh, just having a few or smaller projects that can come to fruition earlier and then yeah, go ahead and then make some investments that will take a little longer to actually come out and, and end, up, end up with some larger wins um, down the line. But just make sure you're kind of keeping that, that balance in place so that you've got, um, so that you're not, uh, that, that can be very difficult depending on your field. Um, but uh, because these things tend to be larger and complex and take longer, you often have to sort of he hedge a little bit with smaller projects that you ha that have shorter timelines um, that you have got a little bit more control over. Is my advice usually. Um, so I I usually um, <clears throat> I think about team science as you know in, in the literature um, 
when we think about big teams, that's usually about doing something, right? It's about actually like you've already identified some set of tasks and, and you need to actually go and do it, right? Um, and, and we all know about, you know, giant funding programs that have been for this. But the innovation happens in small teams of, you know, two, five people, right? But learning how to talk to one other person or three other people um, and how the, your, the, the different theories and epistemologies from your disciplines come together um, in and of itself does take investment. Um, and so the advice that I usually give to early stage PIs is to think about how you can join those teams as a supporting member um, as opposed to as uh, one of the people um, trying to, to do the hard intellectual integration. Um, and so you get to witness that happening. You get to be part of that experience. And you can still have the research that you're accomplishing be very tightly tied to your research identity that you're trying to build and carry through your tenure process. And you will be well positioned to lead those teams when you are feel like you're ready to do so from the the rest of your career's perspective. Um, I, I, I think that we will buy down the, the cost of some of those things over time, both by how we structure the institution and the incentives in place and how students are educated. They'll come better equipped um, than I am to do these things. Um, but that, you know, I, I never want to sugarcoat the idea that, um, you know, if you base your, your early, your pre-tenure, um, plan on 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 doing convergent uh, research or transdisciplinary research. That's a hard road to choose as your primary method of getting tenure, um, and it's our job to to make that less hard um, over time. But right now, I think that that's a you know be strategic about how you plug into those teams as opposed to having that be your strategy. Thank you, and um, you know we have just a few more minutes here and. I'd like to turn just a little bit different. Um, several of you mentioned part of your interdisciplinarity or your goals involve working with the community, working with those outside of academia. And so I wonder if you've identified both specific benefits, why bother, and um, challenges to making those kinds of collaborations work. And I'll see who hits their unmute button fastest. Oh, Mindy did. I'm not muted because I have a very quiet home. I'm looking to see if Monica is still, is Monica Kowal still, still um, on the call? I think she had to drop off, unfortunately. She's our director of community engagement. So I was gonna give her a nod if she was here. Um, but um, I think, you know, one of the things we're exploring in our webinar is what it means to do transdisciplinary research as opposed to interdisciplinary research. And one of the, one of the characteristics of transdisciplinary research is that it begins with a, a, real, a problem in the real world. And it also begins with asking, you know, with, with working with an actual, you know, with communities and helping them to identify research questions rather than just coming to a community with a research question. And, and, I, and I think that, um, that that is the future of actual, of research um, at, at research institutions. And I think that we would all um, benefit by, by uh, training up in that, in, in, in that, um, way of being, and I and I and I, I say that in part because I think that um, part of the future um, role of of academia is contextualizing our own knowledge a little bit better and looking at ways in which communities also have types of knowledge that can be integrated and shared within um, within the, um, within our knowledge systems that we tend to privilege in in the ivory tower, and so I think that that's a that's a piece of that's a piece of the puzzle. So I think that that's a, especially uh, in certain contexts, like I said, in an environment, natural resources context, that's particularly critical. Um, in a place like New Mexico, where we have so many living native communities with so much um, traditional knowledge to share about a changing climate, for example, and about having lived in lived um, for and persisted in in um, our in our in our world, um, there's just a lot. Um, of humility that we can bring um, to the questions that we have and a lot that we can benefit from as we enter into 
co-producing um, the knowledge that we need to have a resilient uh, uh, way of being here. So um, that's my pitch for community-based work. I think the only thing I would add to that, um, and, I, and I think this is part of what Mindy was, was also saying, is that the community needs to be involved from the beginning, um, not just sort of, you know, like the scientists are doing this and then add community, you know, so it needs, it needs to be, you know, you know keep the consultation needs to be taking place from, from the very beginning. Yeah, um, so I mean, we're, um... At the co-op, I think about community in a couple of different ways. Um, one is we have the, the co-op's extended community, meaning that we have um, an extended community of, of researchers um, who are, are, are people within our centers, um, students that are working there, and, and then all of the people that come to our um, come to our events and, and, and are, are participating with us in some way or another. Um, and then I think about the 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 that community not really as having any boundary between that community and and the, the the place in which we live and the people who live here and so part of the co-op's approach to trying to facilitate that type of work is that we'll when we bring um speakers a portion of those speakers are not intended to be speakers that have um, academic or professional expertise, but are people who are speaking from um, an experience about themselves and their place and what they have ex they are um, experiencing or have experienced and and inviting researchers to that and the community to that so that the conversation begins with a story and we're not pre-formulating um, kind of how we see that problem from any given perspective. Instead, everybody in the audience, whether they're a community member or a different type of researcher or scientist, can, can see that from their own perspective. And that's how we have we see that as a useful way of getting everybody to kind of look in the, you know, in the same direction with their own lens. Um, and, and so that it, the community is, it is necessarily the source of that um, coming together of ideas uh, amongst the, the participants. Thank you. Um, I'll pause one more time. Does anybody else on the call want to bring up a, a last issue before we finish? Advance has um, a stated goal of ending Zooms five minutes before the hour so that people have a break before the next one. <laughs> um, Okay, not seeing anything. I want to thank each of our panelists and um, Irene, who's um, been managing stuff in the background, and um, hope that all of you will um, check out the Advance website to see upcoming events for um, the rest of the semester, which will be Zooming as well. And um, Hope that you have a great weekend and thank you so much for all of your um, participation. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>